continuing our journey through the concept of the theme of biographies. And our thematic quote is taken from the book, Education, page 145. Ellen White says, no part of the Bible is of greater value than are its biographies. These biographies are, differ in all others in that they are absolutely true to life. And friends, again, I appeal to you, as you study the prophecies and the doctrines and health and families and so forth, I appeal to you in your own personal study, carve out a space even for the biographies. Now, tonight, we're going to take a look at another fellow in the Holy Scriptures, an Old Testament character. We're going to look on the life and the legacy of Achan. Achan. Joshua, the son of Nun, is from the tribe of Ephraim. His writings actually allude to his profession. And in them, he does not mount up to the sublimity of Isaiah, nor does he have the passion like Jeremiah. He doesn't have the eloquence of David. He's just a warrior. His writings allude to his profession, and in them, you get the concept that his hands are leathered. The keloids on his hands and skins are permanent until Jesus comes. He stabs his opponent with swords and dagger, and he flings and dashes firebrands with both hands. And when you read the book of Joshua, he is not really concerned about being eloquent, he's just concerned about getting the job done before the sun goes down. The record says that six nations and 31 king or kingdoms were conquered by him and through him and with him. He accompanied Moses a part of the way when he ascended on Mount Sinai to receive the two tables, the Ten Commandments. He was also one of the 12 who were sent by Moses to explore the land of Canaan and he brought back a good report and it was he and Caleb uh, of the original adults that left made it into the land of Canaan. And under the direction of God, before Moses before his death, he now invests Joshua with, with a public and a solemn manner with authority over the people as his successor. As the gospel, as the gospel succeeds the law, so Joshua succeeds Moses. Now they spent 40 years in the wilderness. They left Egypt in 1445 BC, and in 1405 BC now, they now cross into Jordan. They have now left the wilderness. And in the book Patriarchs and Prophet, Ellen White says this now. She says this. I'll give the reference in a moment. She says, the Hebrews entered Canaan, but had not subdued it. It was inhabited by a powerful race who stood ready to oppose their invasion of the territory. She says the various tribes were bonded together by a fear of common danger. One of the strongest fortresses in the land, the large and wealthy city of Jericho. Jericho was the principal seat of idol worship, being devoted especially to Astaroth, the goddess of the moon. Here, centered all that was vilest and most degrading in the religion of the Canaanites. To reduce Jericho was seen by, by Joshua to be the first step in the conquest of Canaan. So Joshua now withdraws himself in Joshua 5. He withdraws himself to meditate, to contemplate, to reflect on, on the, the dauntless tasks that lies before him. And if you have your Bibles, go to Judges, pardon me, Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. And I want you to keep your finger in Joshua 5 and also chapter, jo Joshua 7. Put a marker in chapter 7 because we're going we're gonna to tarry there. Joshua chapter 5. Bible says in verse number three, 13 now, Joshua chapter 5, are we there? Uh, verse 13. And it says, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for the adversary? 
And I want you to contemplate the question tonight. Are you for us or you, are you for the adversary? Look at verse 14 now. Verse 14 says now, and he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, that word Lord is in all caps, underscore. I am now come. And Joshua now fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith the Lord, my servant? Verse number 15 says now, and the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And so Joshua did. This was the same command that was given to his predecessor, uh, 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 Moses, uh, a few years ago. Page some prophet now, page 487, Ellen White. Ellen White says this now. She says, Loose thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Reveal the true character of the mysterious stranger. It was Christ the exalted one in his pre-incarnate state who stood before the lead of Israel, awe-stricken. Joshua fell on his face and, 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 and heard the assurance, I have given in thine hands Jericho and the kings thereof and the mighty. Verse 14 now, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he worshipped and said unto him, What said my Lord to his servant? Joshua chapter 6 now. Look at verse 6 now. Joshua 6, Joshua 6 verse 2 says now, And the Lord said unto Joshua, I have given in thine hands Jericho. Jericho. They had to conquer Jericho. Now friends, all of us have some Jerichos in our lives. As a matter of fact, for us to really and truly, um, really uh, and truly enjoy the blessings of the Lord, we're going to have to confront the Jerichos that that are in our lives. Now this Jericho, Jericho in my estimation can take two forms. It was a strong city, a very perverted city, a city that was devoted to wickedness. In order for them to safely dwell in Canaan, they'd have to root out and stomp out root and branch. Jericho must fall. And I believe Jericho can symbolize what we call the hereditary tendencies towards evil. These are tenets and traits which we get from our parents. Are you with me? Jericho, the Jerichos, right? It sometimes shows up in the DNA. Things that our parents pass down, wicked, strong, proclivity, tendencies towards evil. These things must be overcome. Are you with me? In Ezekiel chapter 16, 44, the Bible says, as is the mother, so is her daughter. There it is, hereditary tendencies towards evil. Where I'm from, there's an idiom that says, the apple never falls far from the tree. And what this really means is that the, 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 this the, the express the idea that a person inevitably shares the traits with, which resembles his or her parent family tree. As with the mother, so is the child. Ellen White says in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 371, she says, what the parents are, to a great extent, the child will be. The physical conditions of the children, the parents, pardon me, the dispositions, the appetites, uh, their mental and moral tendencies are to, in a greater or less degree, reproduced in the child, children. These Jerichos, she says, if before the birth of the child, she, the mother, is self-indulgent. If she is selfish, if she is impatient, if she is exacting, these traits will reflect the disposition of the child. Thus, many children have received as a birthright almost, and thank God for almost, and almost unconquerable tendency towards evil. Jericho can take the disposition of the hereditary tendencies that are handed down from the third and the fourth generation. Then Jericho takes on another shape. Jericho can symbolize for us the cultivated tendencies towards evil. Hey, there are some bad habits I picked up. My mother never drank or never smoked or never, but I picked up these habits as I went through life. The cultivated tendencies towards evil. They must be conquered if we would enjoy 
the bliss of heaven and the boom of Christianity. And so whether hereditary or cultivated, and if we are not gaining the victory over these things, then guess what? Turn the card over. Then they are gaining the victory over us. Over us. Jericho is the key to the promised land. And it must, underscore, it must be conquered. I want you to follow me now. Now, what were the instructions God gave to jo Joshua, Jesus? Joshua chapter 7, 6, 6, verse 17 now. Joshua chapter 6, look at verse 17. The Bible says, The city shall be accursed, even it and all therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab, the harlot, shall live, and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Verse 18 now. Verse 18 says, and ye, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Lest one, you make yourself accursed when you take the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. So there's, a, there's a double curse. If you take it, Joshua, you will be accursed. And if you bring it in the camp, you will make the camp a curse. And not just that, you will trouble the camp. And that word trouble in this original means you may bring a calamity upon the camp. Now, Joshua is the leader. He heard verbally. And it was his job now to disseminate this to Disseminate now. There are some people, I'm going to ask you guys, please mute. If you can mute, because there are people are hearing in the feed, please mute, okay? Please mute. Thank you very much, right? Make the camp a curse. Now, verse 18 now. God now begins to give Joshua additional, detailed instructions. Bible says in verse number 19 of chapter 6, But all the silver and gold and the vessels of brass, of iron, were to be consecrated unto the Lord, and bring into its treasuries. Ellen White says that which could not be destroyed by fire, as the silver and the gold and the vessel of brass and iron were to be devoted to the service of the tabernacle. Only faithful Rahab with her house were spared in fulfillment of the promise of the spies. The city itself was burnt. Its palaces, its temples, its magnificent dwellings with all their luxurious appoint appointments, the rich draperies and the costly garments were to be given to the flame. This was a direct order from the Oval Office. Verse 18 says, again, Joshua, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourself a curse. And when you take, in, take the accursed thing, you make the camp a curse and trouble it. And we know how the story goes. As a little boy, I used to sing the song Around the walls of Jericho, around the walls of Jericho, around the walls of Jericho, the army went seven times without a shout, seven times without a shout, seven times without a shout, the army went. When the people made a shout, when the people made a shout, when the people made a shout, the walls fell down and into Jericho at last, into Jericho at last, into Jericho at last, the armies went. Friends, I tell you something, there is hope for your Jericho. There is hope for you in your situation. God is able to give you victory to root out and to stomp out and to burn out the Jerichos in your life that they do not molest and harass and tease you again. That's Joshua chapter 6. Now Joshua is a military man. Once he now conquers Jericho, he, his strength is now revived. He feels now invincible with the arm of Jehovah. Now look at verse chapter number seven now. Chapter number seven, verses one through five, there is a little city called Ai. Joshua now sets his eyes on Ai and 
he had deduced that we don't need to bring most of our veteran soldiers to Ahai. We can stomp Ahai as how you stomp a gnat or a fly. Or we can crush Ahai as how you'd crush an ant. We need not bring our trained man, our robust man, our man who are advanced in the years of service. So Joshua now leads the attack, brothers and sisters, and he now sets his affections on Ai. And the record says now they advance nearly to the gate of the city, but they encountered the most determined, well-organized resistance. What happened? We are told panic-stricken at the numbers of the thoroughly preparation of their enemies, they fled in confusion down the steep descents. The Canaanites were in hot pursuit. They chased them before the gate and smote them going down. The Bible says that 36 men lost their lives. These men had wives and brothers and fathers and children. They lost their lives. They were slain. And isn't it ironic? They overcame big Jericho and fell victim to small little AI. And I thought about this, you know, for too many of us, we, we succumb the big Jerichos. We leave off keeping Sunday and we give up alcohol and gambling and etc. We overcome these big Jerichos. And then we fall victim to little AIs like pride and gossip and laziness, covetousness and unforgiveness the little things songs of solomon 2 15 says take us the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vine overcome by big they overcame big jericho and fell victim to little small ai now joshua now looked upon their ill success uh, expression as an expression of god's displeasure now in Joshua chapter 7 now, look at verse number 10. Keep your finger at Joshua 7, I said now. Scroll down to verse number 10. The Bible says now, Joshua now kneels down to pray. He wants to figure out what is the issue. And the Bible says now in verse 10, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, why liest thou thus upon thy face? Friends, there is a time for prayer, and there's a time for action. And we are told in the spirit of prophecy that those who pray and pray only will cease to pray. What is the problem? Look at verse 11. Israel hath sinned. They have transgressed my covenant or commandment, which I have given them. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. For those who know the story, you will notice, you know it's only one man that sinned. But in this context, the Bible says, Israel, they have sinned. How can one man transition to they? It's what we call in the business world, ascending liability, where one Christian goes out and makes the fool. He embarrasses the whole congregation. One unfaithful nurse, one crooked mechanic robs, uh, uh, robs a, 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 a client, and that client will say, them Zimbabwe Adventists, all are them a thief, all are them a thief. Now, it's only one man. You see, friends, no man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. We are our brother's keeper, and my actions, my actions affect you. Are you with me? One man has sinned, and the Bible says, they have transgressed, and then he says, them. The Bible also says, now, Israel had sinned. They have also transgressed my command, covenant, which I've commanded them, for they, have, for, for they have taken the accursed thing. One man, the they, and have stolen and dissembled also. They have put it even among their own stuff. Verse 12 said, now, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. Brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why we are not more successful in our evangelistic efforts or in our advancement of the world because there are stuff amongst us that God has, has not blessed but have turned their backs before their enemies, before their cursed thing. Neither will I be with them anymore except the accursed thing is destroyed 
from among you. They could not advance in holiness and righteousness as long as the accursed thing was in the midst of the camp. Now we know that the individual who took this was Achan. Now who was Achan? Now the Bible is very, is very, very discreet about his, um, his, his, his beginning. His middle is sketchy, but we know he had a terrible end. Are you with me, right? Now Achan was actually a soldier in Joshua's army. Now we don't know his rank, but we know he was a soldier. And because he was a soldier, therefore he got firsthand information of the directives that Jesus gave to Joshua. Therefore, his sin was the sin of iniquity. Achan sinned against light and knowledge. Achan sinned in the face of illumination. Achan sinned when he knew better. And the sin of iniquity, if it, if it is fostered and continued, it will leave, lead to grieving the Holy Spirit and thus committing the unpardonable sin. So Achan was the culprit. Achan was the culprit. And there are many Achans among us today, altered in form, but same in nature and disposition. We are told in volume four of the testimonies, page 492, Ellen White says, no man lives to himself. No man lives to himself. Shame, defeat, and death were brought upon Israel by one man's sin, the protection which had covered their heads in the time of battle were withdrawn. Various vicious, various sins that are cherished and practiced by professed Christians bring the frown of God upon a church. The frown of God rests upon us. That's in volume four, page 492. Then she says now in third testimonies, volume three of the testimonies, page 265, the prejudice which has arisen against us because we have reproved the wrongs that God has shown me existed. And the cry that has been raised of hardness and severity are unjust. God bids us speak and we are not to be silent if wrongs are apparent among us, his people, and if, they, if the servants of God pass on indifferent to them, they virtually sustain and justify the sinner and are alike guilty and will just as surely receive the displeasure of God. They will be made responsible for the sins of the guilty. Friends, if you don't call it what it is, and I don't call it what it is, it's going to be written down by our name. It doesn't mean now that we're going to pry into people's business and set up webcams and bug their phones and tap their, 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 their no friends. She says, if sins, if, if, if wrongs are apparent, if it's in your face and in your space, then you ought to tell it like a T-I-S-S says and let the chips fall where they may. Tell it in love. Tell it with a Christ-filled personality, but you've got to tell it. She says, among church members, oh, in good and regular standing. What does that mean today? All that means is if you return your tithe and offering. Doesn't matter how wicked and vicious and vile you live, as long as you return that one tenth, even if you don't even come to church on Sabbath, mail it in. You are still classified as in good or regular standing. She says, among church members, in good or regular standing, there are, alas, many Achans, altered in form, but same in nature. Man comes stately to church sits at the Lord's table while among his possessions are things that God hath cursed. And so sometimes the accursed thing shows up in our homes, friends. Thanks to social media and internet, we have allowed abominations after abomination to take root in our homes. And we are told there are some homes that angels do not visit because they are not commissioned to dwell where wickedness abound. In the book of Deuteronomy, let's go there quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Hold your finger at Joshua 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. The Bible says now, Neither shall you bring an abomination into thine house. Why? Lest thou be a cursed thing like it, but thou shalt utterly detest it, 
and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing, brothers and sisters. We should not allow things which are condemned by the word of God, whether it be via books, via, via movies, via songs, via artwork. And we talk about culture. Culture have to subject itself to scriptures. Now, there are some benign things in our culture that are, that are good, but there are some things that are devilish and they must be denounced. Sometimes the accursed thing, it shows up in our homes and demons now come and massage and molest us. Joe Cruz in his book says, no one can deny that there has been an, a, a, a weakening in our traditional posture against worldliness. Under the influence of television, the Adventist lifestyle has become seriously breached and compromised. Practices once shunned as unacceptable and intolerable in an Adventist home are no longer issues yeah. of loyalty to the faith. Friends, I want to tell you something. We are told that by beholding you become changed. And the mind gradually adapts itself to the theme it is left to dwell upon. And wives, I'm telling you this, take me very seriously. If all your husband watch is murder and murder and murder, you need to start sleeping with one eye open. Did you hear what I said, friends? Because by beholding, you become changed. Sometimes the accursed thing shows up in our homes. But alas, sometimes the accursed thing shows up on the people of God. Now, there was a time in the Adventist church where if you wanted to see a clown, you had to go to the circus. What do you mean? 2 Kings chapter 9. Let's go there. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse number 30. If you wanted to see a clown, you had to go to the circus. 2 Kings chapter 9, quickly. Look at verse number 30. The Bible says this. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tied her here and looked out the window. This is the first mention of mascara or makeup in the scripture. And it is on a whore named Jezebel. And that's scriptural. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30. Jeremiah says, and when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, thou deckest thyself with ornaments of gold, thou rentest thy face with paint, in vain shall thou make thyself fair. There was a time where seven heaven cities would not wear makeup. They would exercise and, 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 and use olive oil and coconut oil. They would take care of their skin. They would, they would, they would exercise, brothers and sisters. Get plenty of sunlight, drink your green juice, and let your skin glisten and glow. But alas, even the accursed thing shows up on the people of God. Sometimes the accursed thing shows up in the attitude amongst us as a people. We have some dark attitude amongst us. We are a rebellious people. And the only sermons we like to hear are the ones that tickle us and tease us and tantalize us, but leave us without transformation. A man, you will pay a man to tell you a lie. A man tell you the truth. I won't invite him back to his church as if you're spiting that man. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says this, for rebellion is as a spirit of witchcraft and stubbornness as, as, I, as iniquity and idolatry. And have I become your enemy? Because I thus tell you the truth, we are a rebellious people that say to the prophets, see not. And to the seers, to the preachers, prophesy unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceit, preacher. Sometimes the accursed thing shows up sometimes Oh, in the music on Sabbath. We have come to a point now, friends, where we hear the, the, bombastic, uh, bam, the bombastic beat of Babylon bombarding the churches all across this world. This inane repetition that induces hypnosis. One stanza, they sing up, alto, tenor, bass. Up, alto, tenor, bass. Over and over and over. It is a mantra. And you don't hear the hymns of Zion anymore. You don't hear the songs written by Franklin Belden and our pioneers, but we hear these strange music, and most of them are doctrinally incorrect. They don't, they don't line up with our doctrines. It is an accursed thing. 
I say it. Sometimes it shows up in our bookstore. Lord have mercy. I tell you something, friends. I was, I was, I was at a, I was at a large bookstore. I won't call the city's name. Big bookstore. One of our bookstores. And I went into, went in to try to find a copy of the book, Cross and the Shadow by Stephen Haskell. And I kid you not, when I went in, the store manager was there. And I said to her, ma'am, I'm looking for this book by Stephen Haskell, The Cross and the Shadow on the Sanctuary. And the woman said, she looked at me like I was speaking Swahili or Shona. She was like, what? Never heard of him. Never heard of that book. No, there's no sin in not knowing. But as I turned to exit, you know what I saw? I saw a whole display case of T.D. Jake's book, Woman Thou Art Loose. I felt like kicking that accursed thing over, but I had to con control myself. Sometimes it shows up in our bookstores. Sometimes the accursed thing shows up in our classrooms. We are hearing concepts and ideologies. One parent called and asked me, Pastor Not, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, was there an ice age? I said an ice age? Not based on Genesis. After the flood, that was it. <laughs> Before the flood, there was no ice age. She said, you know, a teacher in, the, uh, one in our institution is teaching the ice age. I said, you teach that, you begin to move into evolution. Sometimes these concepts, fine, and I'm not here knocking our souls, don't get me wrong now, friends, but this thing cannot continue and we cannot move forward while these accursed things are present in our institution. Concepts and ideologies that our pioneers never heard about are now taught and books of a new order are written and our young people go to these school from sane homes, conscious homes, and when they come back, they're unconscious and insane, some of them in the membrane. I know what I say, friends. Now, lest I stand here and generalize tonight, I want us to hone our attention back to this, this military man, Aiken. I want us to now look at the steps that led to his demise because if we don't change, his steps can be our steps. Joshua chapter 7 now. There were five steps that led to Achan's demise. And I want us to look at them carefully now. Joshua chapter 7, look at verse number 2. The first thing that led to Achan's demise was this. The Bible says in verse 2 now, And when I saw, stop, there it is. When he saw, <laughs> friends, his eyes were bewitched. His eyes were charmed. This was the same thing that got Eve in trouble. Genesis, write it down. And when the woman saw, there it is. This was the same thing that got Lot in trouble. Genesis chapter 13. And Lot lifted up his eyes. You know, in ancient times, when the Lord... When, when the Lord instituted the priesthood, in order to be a priest, there were certain criteria. Now, all priests came from the tribe of Levi, but all Levites couldn't be priests. Why? If you had any deformities, you couldn't be a priest. Leviticus 21 verse 20 says now, a, or a crook back, or a dwarf, or he that hath a blemish in his eye. You see, if you had cock eye, you couldn't be a priest. And too many of us, we are looking both ways. We have eye on the world and eye on the church. Our eyes must be single, according to Jesus, single to the glory of God. He had gone there to destroy Jericho, but his eyes, he saw the glitter and the glamour. So the first step to his demise was he saw. He saw. He took his eyes off the mission at hand. He saw. The second thing that led to Achan's demise is in the text now. The Bible says now, he says, uh, 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 then I coveted. Oh, friends. He saw, then he coveted. You see, no man comes to sudden ruin. It takes time to corrupt the soul. One departure from principle begins the journey. He saw, then he coveted. Again, in order to be a priest, when Moses now was about to institute the leaders in Israel, to be a leader in Israel, you had to meet several qualifications. Exodus chapter 18. Go there quickly now. Exodus 18. 
Look at verse 21. Exodus 18, quickly now, verse 21 says this now. In order to be a leader in Israel, you had to meet these qualifications. Exodus 18, 21 says now, Moreover, thou shalt provide out all the people, able men, such as one, fear God, two, men of truth, three, hating covetousness. They had to have a vehement hatred for covetousness, which is the 10th commandment. Achan saw and Achan coveted. And I want to say Achan's problem is our problem today. Ellen White says the deadly sin of, that led to Achan's ruin had its root in covetousness. She says, of all the sins, one of the most common and most lightly regarded, while other offenses are met with detection and punishment, how readily, do, how rarely, pardon me, does the violation of the 10th commandment so as much as call for censure. I have never seen anybody in the Adventist church get disfellowship or censured for covetousness. Oh, she's too covetous. Let's bring her before the board. No, friends. She says, the enormity of the sin and its terrible results are lessons of Achan's history. And you know, friends, we are told that the greatest sin that currently exist in the Seventh-day Adventist church is the sin of covetousness. We are a, we are a covetous people and we have come to a point where the grass looks greener on the other side. But what you don't know is that the water will made it more expensive. We are now coveting things that we should not covet and God has given us everything we need to prosper in this life and in the life to come. She said Achan had cherished greed of gain until it became a habit. A habit. And you do something long, it becomes a habit. Binding him in fetters. Lord have mercy. Well, nigh impossible to break. While fostering this evil, he would have been filled with horror at the thought of bringing disaster upon Israel. But his perceptions were deadened by sin. And when temptation came, he fell an easy prey. His perception was deadened. You know, I had to have surgery. I played ball, you know, when I would get injured, my, soldier, my shoulder would pop, would pop out. And I had to have a serious surgery. And they had to now deaden the area through anesthesia. I had to get anesthesia, anesthesiologist. And they had to put an adequate amount of that powerful drug to deaden, to numb the place where the surgeon would go in and pull the tendons, friends. I could not, well, I was asleep anyway, right? But I could not feel anything. And friends, I'm here to tell you something. If we hold on to, to the accursed thing long enough, it deadens our perception that we can't see anything wrong with it. And you know, the thing can be as plain as the nose on your face. And they will tell you, preacher, I don't see anything wrong with it. And I used to believe that they're faking. But you know, it is possible for you to indulge in a thing long enough, hard enough, where you can't see anything wrong with going to the movies and watching these filthy, abominable shows. They can't see anything wrong with ecumenicalism. They can't see anything wrong. And friends, I'm here to tell you, they really can't see. You know what happens? Jeremiah says in his day, were they ashamed, Jeremiah 8, 12, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. You know, blushing is a, is a, is a, is a, is a chemical reaction when we are caught off guard and cheeks turn red. Jeremiah says that they could not even blush. A man could use a dirty word in your presence and you laugh, tells you a dirty joke and you laugh. Man, if you are not offended and act offended, they could not blush. And in 1 Timothy 4, 2, Paul says, they have a conscience sneered. So Achan saw and he 
coveted. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. The Bible says that we are to covet good gifts. So covetous is not a bad thing. It depends on how in its context. Now, I could see if Achan had coveted the strength of Moses or coveted uh, 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 some of the, 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 the faith of, 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 of Joseph or coveted uh, Jacob's prayer life. Are you with me? Or coveted Abraham's steadfastness or if he had coveted something good. But the thing that the man coveted was a doom thing. That don't make any sense. That is nonsense. The Bible says, here it is. He says, when I saw, when I saw among the spoils, the goodly Babylonian garment. He says, I coveted. Achan had coveted the doom things of Babylon. And we have come to a point now, friends, that we are, covet we are coveting doom sermons. The sermons you hear today, they don't make any sense. It's a whole lot of noise and a whole lot of gravy and no substance. We are now coveting doom songs. God says, come out of Babylon. We are now coveting doom methods of evangelism, friends. We are now coveting things that are doomed because after all, the garments should be put to the fire. Only the gold and the silver should be given to the sanctuary. Achan coveted something that was doomed, damned, destined for damnation. In the book of Isaiah 5.20, Isaiah puts a woe upon those, woe unto you who call evil good and good evil. Woe unto you that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe unto you that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. A condemnation rests upon anyone who tries to justify, vote, sanction that which God hath condemned. That's the KJV version. But I like what the New Living Translation says. It says this, you are doomed. You who call evil good and good evil. You are doomed, you who turn darkness to light and light out. You are doomed who put bitter for sweet and put sweet for bitter. The man had committed doomed things. Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylon, he said this. In ancient times, people wore their religion on their garments. It's nothing uncommon today. Why a man likes Arsenal, he buys an Arsenal jacket and the big gun is there. Are you with me? He likes Liverpool, he, then you have the, the rooster or whatever. You see, the principle was in ancient times, people wore their gods on their garments. And that is why when the children of Israel made their garments, they were told that they were to put fringes of blue on their borders, so because the blue was indicative of the commandments. So the pagans had the same concept. So I could imagine this man Achan. Now he doesn't, you see, sin turns you into madness. Here's a man now, and, and so what happened now, the Babylonians would have their gods on their garments. Are you with me? They would have their gods. Now think, what in the world or where would this man wear this garment to? He could wear it to the temple. Is you crazy? He could wear it to the social. All he could do is put it on in his tent, look in the mirror, and spin around, friends. That's the furthest he could wear because once he stepped out of the camp, they would know. Akon, where you get that from? Where did you order it online? Was it a catalog? <laughs> Send me the link, Akon. Where did you get that from? That's not from the, the Israel um, clothing store. We don't wear those funny garments. And friends, we have come to a point now that we're seeing some funny garments among, amongst us. We are seeing things that are there and there is a style of dress which is, is sodomic in its nature. It is called unisex. And the Bible says that man should not put on what woman put on. That's in the Bible. And that was not nailed to the cross. This man coveted something that was doomed. I ask you, what doomed things are you coveting? What doomed 
ideology? What doom concepts are you putting forth? And you know, it, it's so sad, friends. It is so sad that we covet after them so much. We are willing to bring them to our camp to teach us to do evangelism, yet they will not even invite us to their camp to do the benediction. Coveting doom things. So Achan saw. Achan coveted doom things. Then the next step is he took. There it is. Go back to Joshua chapter 7, verse 2. The Bible says now, and I took them. He stole. He stole. You see, brothers and sisters, you see, one sin really rides by itself. It's like a crew or a clan. Because if you lie, you will steal. And if you steal, you may kill to cover your tracks. So he coveted, and then this man was willing to sacrifice principle, and he took something that did not belong to him. Now, I believe that, that as a military man, I believe he was fairly compensated because God is a fair God. God is not going to overwork and underpay you. I believe he was rightly compensated as a soldier. We were told that the silver should be brought back to the camp and devoted to the Lord's sanctuary, maybe to be melted down and to help make things for the Lord's sanctuary. So Achan took 30, how much wedge of silver? He took uh, 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 50 shekels uh, 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 of wedge of gold and he brought them into the tent. Now, my friends, this man had a family. And I believe when he brought in his tent, Mrs. Aiken probably said, honey, where you get that from? And he probably said, well, you know how the thing go already. <laughs> uh, God will understand. After all, I'm a soldier. God will understand. Friends, today we hear people are rationalizing. I hear it. God will. Things out with our PhD, permanent head damage, and our all kind of deeds like a dentist. We begin to reason things out. God will understand. God will overlook. After all, times have changed, and we need it. I hear the sentiments everywhere I go. They say, not your old time. No, God is old. He's called the ancient of days. And there are certain things that does not change. So he began to rationalize. So he saw it. He coveted it. Something doomed. He took it. And the Bible says the next step is he had to hide. You know, let me tell you something. If you have to hide when you do something, check it. Hide. Joshua chapter 7, verse 2. The Bible says, He took them, and behold, they are. He hid them. Friends, let me tell you something. You may hide from the pastor. You may hide from the elder. You may hide from the deacon. You may hide from the parents. But you can't hide from God. God sees in the dark. God sees behind closed doors. God sees around corner. The eyes of the Lord, where is to and fro the whole earth, he beholds the evil and the good, and angels are keeping record. You can't hide from God. God sees all and he hears all. This man hid this thing in the tent. He hid it and he comforted himself that nobody could see. But I believe that God was still working with Achan. And I believe that God gave Achan time, space to repent. And brothers and sisters, I read somewhere that no man drowns by falling into the water. Let me say it again. No man drowns by falling into the water. The thing that drowns a man is remaining in the water. You see, it is not sinning that will damn a man. It is sinning without repentance. So even though he had sinned, I believe that there was still space for repentance. 
And friends, you may have taken the accursed thing in your home or you may have married the accursed thing, friends, but there is still hope for you. The Bible says in Isaiah 1 verse 8, come now, come, come the man. Let us, re let, let's reason, let's, let's talk over your issues, God says. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them as crimson and like wool. One of the things I learned from, 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 from Aiken's life is that God is a very patient God, you know. As a matter of fact, God's mercies are like a wild stallion unbroken. When God's mercies come into town, it is quick, it is swift, it is swift. When God's justice comes to town, it's like a turtle. Slow, but by and by, we'll catch up to you. You can run, but you can't hide. Are you with me? God's mercies are swift, but God's justice is slow. Nahum 1, 3 says, oh, the Lord is slow. Slow to what? Slow to anger. But great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. When God sends down judgment upon a person, you must know he must have reached his limit. Charles Spurgeon said this, when mercy cometh into the world, she driveth wings steed. The axles of her chariot wheels are glowing with, hot, with speed. But when wrath cometh, it walketh in the tardy steps. It is not in haste to slay. It is not swift to condemn. God's rod of mercy is ever in his hand outstretched. God's sword of justice is in his scab, not rusted in it, but easily withdrawn. He says, oh, friends, God is slow to anger. He says, men who are passionate and swift in anger give a word and a blow. Sometimes a blow first and then a word. Stop, you know, you know my grandmother, boy, you know, with Jamaican parents, they are swift to anger. Boy, they will spank you first and then come let me talk to you. Some of them will spank you while they're talking to you. Why you don't stay still? But not God. You see, we, Spurgeon says oftentimes kings, when subjects have rebelled against them, have crushed them first and then reasoned with them afterward, communism. All right. They have given no time for, for threatening, no period of repentance. They have allowed no space of turning to their allegiance. They have at once crushed them in their hot displeasure, making a full end, but not so with God. Before rain falls, there's lightning and there's thunder. So it is, friend, before judgment comes, God always sends warning. He will not drown the earth except he sends an hour. He will not destroy Nineveh except he sends a Jonah. He will not destroy Sodom except he finds 50. God is merciful. And I believe that God gave Achan time to repent. But friends, let's not fool ourselves. The Bible says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. One of these days, your sin is going to pinpoint you and Achan's sin did find him out. Go back to J J Joshua, Joshua chapter 7. Look at verse number 16 now. Joshua 7, 16. The Bible says now, so after Joshua is on his knees, by, well, let me, let, me, let me forget it. On his knees, God tells Joshua, Israel has sinned. They have taken the accursed thing. And you cannot conquer any other nation. You can't advance in holiness while you're still living in sin. We've got, you're going to have to seek out and search out and punish the accursed thing. And so Joshua rose from his knees. A man on a mission now. And the Bible says, that Joshua summoned the 12 tribes. You see, God is a God of order. And as Joshua began to search out the accursing, the Bible says first, he began with tribes. That's plural. There were 12 tribes. And finally now, when he cast the lot, the lot fell on the tribe of 
Judah. Are you with me? The tribe of Judah. Now, the Bible says now, he cast lots and it fell on families. Now, Achan had time. Come forth, come forth, Achan. Come forth, confess, confess, Achan. Achan could have still come forth. It's coming closer. It's coming home. And the Bible says now, Joshua moved from tribes. Don't miss that, friends. That's the investigative judgment right there. Every name is, is mentioned. Every name is scrutinized. Tribes, then tribe, families. And the Bible says, then it moved on now down to family. It's coming close to home now, Achan. Achan, repent. Repent, I beseech you. Put away sin. The Bible says it came now down to his households. Plural. He cast some more lot and he came down to the household. Brothers and sisters, now it was too late. Achan's house was pinpointed. This man had a large family. He had a wife. He had children. He had servants. He had animals. The Bible says it came down to man by man. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. A time is coming, says Zephaniah 1 verse 12, where the Lord is going to search Jerusalem with a candle. God's going to search out because, friends, you see, the Adventist church cannot progress we cannot give the loud cry. We cannot fulfill the mandate because the accursed thing, we who should go and teach, we have now gone to learn. We who, should go, we who should go and evangelize, we are now being evangelized. There was a time where, I'm telling you friends, where when a man left the Adventist church, he would hang out in the world. Listen, when I left the church, friends, it wasn't because I had lost faith in the doctrines. It was because of the girls and the world and the music. But I still believe in the doctrines, friends. But we have come to a point where people are leaving the Adventist church and becoming Baptists and Pentecostals and Catholic. What? What? Friends, we cannot go forward. And that is why the latter rain will not be poured out in copious measures until the Lord shake his church and search out the accursed thing. Then we can conquer and conquer like Joshua did. The Bible says, I will search Jerusalem with a lamp and I will punish those who are settled down comfortably and who say to themselves, the Lord will do no good. The Lord will do no evil. Zephaniah says this now. Friends, I'm telling you, God is getting ready to search for the accursed thing in the Adventist church. And you see, God is a God of order. He's not going to kick you in the door like Hawaii 5 and say, hands up. God is a God of order, and all things is done decently in order. And when God begins to search in my, my mind's eye, I believe he's going to begin with general conference. Oh, yes, God, there is follies and foolishness going on there. The accursed thing is there. He's going to search, but he's not going to just stop there. Remember, Tribes and tribes, he's going to move on down to the division. And, yes, and, no, and when he begins in North American division, they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The loose liberalism, the misuse of money, the mismanagement of the tithe dollar. Because there's no accountability. God's going to search. He's not just going to stop at the division. He's going to come on down to the union. Some of these liberal union presidents with their loose liberalism. He's not going to stop at the union only. He's going to come on down to local conferences. These money, greedy presidents. Only thing they're concerned about is numbers and money. God, and they allow their cursed thing to go on at camp meeting and youth federations and youth gatherings. God's going to search. Well, he's not going to stop there, friends. It's coming closer. He's going to stop by local churches. Yes, he's going to stop by local, big churches, small churches. And he's going to search and seek out the accursed thing. But hold on, friends. He's not going to stop there. He's coming to the house. And woe be unto that mother and that father. Woe be unto that child who have been disobedient to the principles of God as set forth in the Bible and the prophecy. But hold on, 
He's not going to stop there. He's going to search. Come on down to our schools. New Bold, Oakwood, Loma Linda last year. You name it, NCU, PCU. He's going to come on Lovebird School because the accursed thing are there. He's going to come on down to our hospitals, then stop by our bookstore. But alas, it's going to be a man by man. Every man is going to have to give an account for the deeds done to and in his body. Brothers and sisters, God's going to search. So let's look at Achan's plot, his plight. He saw, he coveted, he took, he hid. Friends, he was punished. Now Achan's death was an unusual death, but it is a death that that, 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 that typifies the end time death. And I'm going to show you. Look at verse number 18 in um, uh, Joshua chapter 7. Look at verse 18 now. The Bible says this, friends, verse 18. And he brought his household man by man. And Achan, the son of Camry, the son of Zadbi, the son of Zek Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. He was seized. Verse 19 says, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord of Israel. Make confession, no? Huh? Too late, friends, and a time is coming. If, I, 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 if you don't confess now, you won't confess then. And the Bible says now, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hid, hide it not from me. Don't hide it, John. Make, it was too late anyway. Make confession. Bible says in 22 now, and Joshua sent messengers. Well, he said, when I saw the goodly Babylonian garment, I took it. Even in the face of death, he was still calling it goodly. 20, 22 says now, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hid in the midst, the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them to Joshua and the Israelites. 24 says now, and Joshua and all Israel with Achan took Achan, not just Achan, the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedges of gold and his sons. That's his children. And his daughters. Now, the wife isn't there, but we can read that she may be in there. Now, friends think. And his oxen and his ass, even the ox, the poor donkey who didn't do anything, had to suffer, friends. Sometimes the good, now, friends, I've all of them wondered. Why didn't the children say, Daddy, I'm going to tell Mommy. Or you know what? Daddy, you know this thing is not right. I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want to be a part of this apostasy. I am, this, as a matter of fact, I am going to tell Joshua. They could have done that. But you know, sometimes, you know what I've learned? Sometimes with the family, Ellen White talks of the filial. She talks about the, the silken cause of affection where parents can be in the wrong and the children are afraid to correct their parents. Or the parents can love their children so much. Love their children so much. Like, you know what? Oh, I love them. And they let their children go on and wrong. Not helping their children. Rather, they are hurting their children. The Bible says this now, brothers and sisters. His daughters, his sons, the oxen, the asses, the sheep, and even his tent. Right? And that all he had, and they were brought into the valley of Achor. You don't want to forget that valley. You know what Ezekiel said? 
you know, why couldn't Achan say, you know what, Lord, it was my sin. You need not kill my children. There's a text in the Bible that says this, Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Are you with me, friends? The son partook of the father's sin. Therefore, the son has to stand his own punishment. The text says, the son shall not bear the iniquity for the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son, but the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Son sinned, son must die. Daughters sin, daughters must die. Achan sin, he must die. Verse 25 says now, and Joshua said, why hath thou troubled us? The trouble was, you caused 36 men to lose their lives because of selfishness. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And the Bible says, and all Israel stoned him with stones. Stop there. And burned them with fire. So what came first? What came first? Fire? No. First, judgment came. He was judged. Then he was stoned. Then fire. Think now. The last plague. What is entailed in the last plague? Hail. Hail is a type of stoning. Right after the last plague is finished, Jesus comes, they are destroyed. Then the millennium, then the second, second the, 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 uh, the, uh, the millennium comes down, thousand years, what happens? The righteous are resurrected and they are burnt with fire. What the wicked, pardon me, are burnt with fire. Here we see a order of what will take place in the last days, friends. Stone with fire. And they were stoned. Friends, I could imagine the weeping and the wail and the crying, the wails that day. I could imagine the children crying out, God have mercy, God of Jacob, God of Isaac. God, I could imagine the goat saying, oh, 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 donkey brain. The chicken, everything is, is pandemonium. Friends, it was unnecessary to die that day. They were stoned with stones. They met their demise. You know, I have come to realize this. I was preaching, a, I was doing a campaign out, outside the country. And the conference president, he was offended because I said something, which it was true. But nevertheless, somebody wrote a note. And I felt offended at the note. And I said to them, brethren, you know, do not insult my intelligence. People are not going to go to hell because they put on jewelry or makeup or what they ate or what they did not eat or what day they worship or not worship. People are going to be lost because of disobedience. God said, don't do it, and you disobeyed. That's why we are lost. Don't so much focus on the little things or the big things. It's the principle of disobedience, brothers and sisters. Verse 26 says, and they raised over him a great heap of stones on his, on, 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 on to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger Wherefore, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And God told Joshua, when you write, write it down. Put this man's biography in the book so that future generations who will come hereafter will understand it is dangerous to trifle with sin. You do so at the peril of your own mortal soul. And as I close, Ellen White says this, you know, oftentimes we pay a high cost for a low living, brothers and sisters. 
and we sell ourselves so cheaply. She says, for a goodly Babylonian garment, multitudes sacrifice the approval of conscience and their hope of heaven. Friends, now is repentant time. Now is not the time to be compromising. Now is the time to search our own lives and see whether or not the things that we are doing is justified by scripture. And friends, whatever it is, God is saying, my child, if you confess that sin, I will forgive you. And let us forgive. I will give you strength to overcome. Friends, let us learn from the life of Achan that God means what he says. And he says what he means. Let us pray. Father in heaven, O oh God, we, we are troubled, Lord, on every side, but not distressed. Because there is hope in Jesus for us. We have a high priest that is currently interceding in our behalf. And if we would just confess, he will forgive and cleanse us and impart in us the spirit to help us to live a spiritual life. Father, all of us have taken the accursed thing in some way, shape, or form. We have not been obedient to God. We are wearing things, eating things, watching things, taking part in things which are condemned by the word of God and the spirit of prophecy. Father, help us to surrender these things before it's too late. May you bless us now. May you give the audience a good night's rest until tomorrow night is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Friends, I hope you are blessed tonight. God bless you and we'll see you tomorrow night.